Zechariah chapter 4, and we're considering the power and purpose of anointing in raising up, in establishing the work of God, the kingdom of God, in our lifetime, in our generation. That's a big one, isn't it? Well, the wonderful thing is verse 6 where it says, This will be accomplished not by might, not by power, and here it means by human power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so you say, okay, if, if God is going to achieve this, these great purposes, what is my role? My role is very simple. My role is to trust. He doesn't require my, you know, as people say, not my ability, but my availability. He requires my confident dependence upon his resources. And there are so many pulls upon us to do something different, to try and lean upon our own intelligence, small though it may be, to lean upon our own money, our own uh, tradition, our own background. He said, no, not by human might, not by human power, never, but by my spirit. What does that look like? First, it means that I have to look towards what God is doing. He is going to be centre stage and not me. I have to be faithful to what he's doing and not my desires to glorify myself or to achieve something for myself. And so I have to negate myself almost, knowing as, as, as my own flesh dies that he will be lifted and in verse 7 it says, Who, what are you mighty mountain? That, that is the sum of human effort. What are you mighty mountain? Babel. Oh great. You know, what are you? you? You will become level ground. So I must identify the obstacles, the things that stand against the work of God, and speak them into submission. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? The more I negate myself, the more I put myself second place to the Lordship of Christ, the more he exalts his purposes through me. I can only be free when I am enslaved to my Christ. It's true. It's a strange paradox. Through my faith in God to my future. Verse 10, he says, Who shall despise the day of small things? I must not be anxious about this present and all the stuff that happens, the circumstances that clutter and fester in my head. I must be faithful to his purposes. And his purposes are going to be developed through key people. It's, it's very clear in, in chapter 4 of Zechariah. He says, men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. We need anointed leaders. And their leaders, oh, this is wonderful. There's some aspects of the vision in verse 7 and verse 10. Uh, the Oil is fed from two olive trees, and so it is a living anointing. It's a continuous anointing. Do you sometimes feel like you're doing something with and for the Lord, and then all of a sudden you, you dry up? Do you feel like that? It could just be me, but I suspect it's you as well. You just sort of do something, and you work, and you get physically tired, but also you get spiritually uh, emptied. Do, do you know what I mean? But the vision here is of two olive trees standing to your right and to your left. And they supply a continuous living anointing. I want to live in a continuous anointing, not a roller coaster of my emotions. So sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. And then there's two wonderful things that go with that continuous anointing. It's the capstone and the plumb line. Do you know what they're for in a building? They set it off. And they supply the line, the true line. They supply truth. And so you need doctrine, don't you? You need corrective doctrine. You need the right word. There's so much weird stuff flashing around the place. I need the capstone, which is Jesus Christ. And I need the plumb line, which is the line of righteousness. I need to know what is right and what is wrong. But it's not just a matter of the truth in my life, not just a matter of, of regulations and facts and figures, but it's an anointing that inspires the truth, those two things at the same time. And finally they, they say, they cry, verse 10, grace to it, grace to it, isn't that great? 
grace to it, and rejoice in verse 10. So what does that mean? There's three things here. We have continuous anointing. We have corrective doctrine, holding it steady. This is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He, what he was doing then, he was drawing a plumb line. One more thing is necessary here. It's the grace and the rejoicing in verse 7 and verse 10. It is contagious favour. Wouldn't you like some of that? <laughs> not, just, not just the anointing going through. The powerful experience of a living God. Not just corrective doctrine, saying what is and saying what isn't true. But a contagious favour. Do you know, people loved to be with Jesus. Sad, degenerate, broken, vulnerable, outsiders love to be with Jesus because he exhibited a kind of contagious favour that made people smile. I want to live in all of those three things. I want to live with a firm grasp, about, grasp on what is true and what is false. A, a, a constant, living anointing through the Holy Spirit, not by my might, but through his Spirit. And to live with a contagious favour. Wouldn't that be good? I think laughter, somebody said laughter is the shortest distance between two people. That's a wonderful statement. There's so much, so little laughter sometimes in our religiousness. Let's go for it. Anointing, favour and good solid teaching. I love it. May God bless you.